Hi, I'm James D'Souza, a psychology teacher. And I'm Willem Vanderhorst, a brand strategist. And welcome to an episode of Teaching Tangents, where every week we go on tangents to answer one of life's big questions. Our theme for season three is career. And today's question is, was there a defining moment in your career progression? And did it affect what happened next? Was there a defining, so uh, sorry, just before I repeat the question. Yeah. So you said we're doing this every week. So we're sort of doing this every week because we just have mismatched schedules and we just had to, we didn't, we missed a couple of weeks. That's true. Oh, because I said this week. After the first episode, yeah. which doesn't really look very good. I know <laughs> we have a back catalog of episodes. So anybody coming to find out about it can listen to other episodes. So it's, you know, it is every week, but sometimes not. <laughs> it's not every week. But this week's episode, this week's episode this week yeah, yeah you're right i didn't okay, think so that. uh no no that's okay i know that we i know that we're just trying to organize our things so we have a proper intro see uh, this but this is what it's like Willem interrupts himself because he has so many great ideas welcome great ideas. to the episode i have a lot of ideas a lot of them are not necessarily great but that's there's greatness in there somewhere there's diamonds in the rough and you're going to answer this <laughs> and question. we're sharing the rough with people <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the creative process that's part of it it is. <laughs> and I think uh, this week's this week's question is, or this episode's question. There we go. This episode's question. Ooh, this episode's question. That's a good yeah, way to say it. It is a good way to say it. Is is one of those re- more reflective questions. So I'll say the question again. All right. Was there a defining moment in your career progression? Did it affect what happened next? Yes, I had a bunch. Uh, well, a bunch. I had I had more than one, clearly more than one defining moment in my career. Uh, and this I hope we're not repeating ourselves because I, I mean, I might be repeating a few of the things that I talked about before, but I don't think, uh, but even in the intro episode to when we re recording teaching tangents and the career one talked about my career a little bit more. And this is probably going to go in a bit more detail about it, mm, which is great because I traveled, changed lives, houses, countries, continents, jobs, careers oh, yeah. multiple times. There are several of those that, well, what they're, all of them are defining moments uh, that affected my career, for sure. So... We did uh, say this in the intro. Your career has been non-traditional. Yes, you like clearly. <laughs> the way you just said it, different continents, countries, career changes, just... It's yeah, so... and I make it sound bigger than it is only because I feel like I know other people that have even more extreme career choices and or have I believe have better handled them or traveled more mm-hmm. or perhaps or also I'd also know people have just traveled a lot and perhaps haven't necessarily I was going to say not necessarily kept a career together but I don't think that's fair actually there are people that have kept that have, that have built careers built around traveling mm-hmm. um because it contrasts completely with mine. Mine feels very conventional yes. with a with a one career change. Yeah, which is which is great because it's a lot more uh probably it matches the experience of a lot more people. And I I've I've had I, that reminds me of a one night I was invited to a party in uh well just a bar gathering. It was a birthday gathering at a bar with friends in uh Chicago. Uh-huh. Uh, and I didn't, most people I did not know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just got to chatting at the bar with somebody and, uh, and just, you know, of course, talked about my story, which I don't realize that is so out there for a lot <laughs> of people is. that listen. Yeah. Every time I'm like, yeah, this is me. And they're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Do you know that's not common? I'm like, really? Is it not? Uh, well, you, but that, this is a really good point. We don't know we're experiencing it we don't know that our experience is any is had we don't know how different it is in the story we're living from other people's we're just yeah. in our own kind of world our own bubble yeah it's that and that's been even more pronounced that there's a lot of conversation out right now on the which is super interesting i was just listening to the latest episode of on the media podcast mm-hmm. from wnyc about uh the facebook um ah, mm-hmm. facebook stuff going on in the media so of course, there's been so uh, anyway. So now this is placing the recording in time. Uh, but last week was when Francis Hagen was on 60 Minutes, and then the Monday global outage. 
So I, mm. I, I had my Thursday class that was um, for my digital brand environment course. So I changed half the course, half the class content to update yep. it, yep. which I also realized this is just this, my teaching is great. And other teacher friends told me that, you know, now that you prepared classes last year, you're going to have to spend a lot less time and be able to benefit from the investment you worked in preparation last year. Except that the teacher friend in question teaches chemistry, which doesn't change every three months, whereas digital environment changes all the time. Uh, so, and I felt like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been doing a good job by my students by not keeping them informed of the changes that are happening right now, which fit the that, that particular class topic. I wanted to talk about algorithms. So it was a perfect time. Anyway, that, that is a sign of a good teacher that you're adapting according to what's happening that is, yeah, that's but a, i'm not that's making a, my life any easier that's for sure well yeah that, but it's good for true. it's good also for my keeping in touch with what's going on a little bit because it's just anyway that's that sort of stuff is also going very i fast. will bring it back to the question we'll, we'll bring seamlessly. it back um but or i will do you want me to no 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 i was just going to finish my um, there was a tangent within the tangent so i'm going to okay. go back to the tangent it's like a, it's like it's, it's that inception you need to go back each level I mean, you can go back to the first level but it's dangerous <laughs> but it's true so we're what three levels deep or two levels deep it's two we're levels two, deep we're two. I'm, i was back at the bar in chicago telling a story yes about you life. were uh, and so this guy goes wow i mean you traveled all these places you've done all these things you just you have the life that i kind of dream of or i've dreamed of but I never actually ever want in reality something like that wow yeah he's like <laughs> i i sometimes kind of think and daydream that it'd be cool to travel all around the world but i really like living and staying in one place the guy was from milwaukee lived in milwaukee and you know had a nice life a nice job that he had for a long time living with his husband and it was like i'm i'm content i don't need to go anywhere uh, nor do i want to it sounds exhausting your life sounds exhausting to me so, I mean, it was a, a great one-liner. I'm not doing it justice, but it was funny and it was a good reminder of the fact that I, you know, I'm in my bubble. I live and I share what's going on with my life and I occasionally meet, which is another reason why, anyway, so I occasionally meet people. Like so, so come back to the question. It was a funny little. Uh, I do so, occasionally call you international man of mystery. Yes, which is very, which is, I mean, I, th I feel like the main benefit of these calls is us two just giving ourselves pats on the back, which feels great. Hopefully we're sharing useful stuff for people who like to listen. We are, but I'm being truthful too, because the, yeah, you've moved around. Okay, which... so defining moments in my career. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I had defining moments even before career. But one was, uh, so I really, really had no idea what I wanted to study and what I wanted to do work-wise. I had... I had daydream, daydream ideas, but not any that I would put real serious effort behind. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, and I still want to be a writer. I mean, I want to write, but I've not been prioritizing that particularly. Um, and I, I really didn't know what I wanted to study. When I was in high school, I was mm. kind of, and most of my school experience was kind of just on cruise control. Mm. Um, I'm one of those that I, and I think it was very obvious to my teachers, but I really, I don't know how much, I mean, it must have been extremely obvious to my teachers. Now that I'm teaching, I'm like, it must have been so obvious that I was just hanging out. And I, I, I built my whole persona around being just, you know, cool and relaxed and laid back. So I was a laid back <laughs> student that just managed to get decent grades doing absolutely nothing. Um, I was listening in class. I did listen in class. Okay. But that's about it. I just, you know, I was just doodling and playing games with my classmates. <laughs> but when you say cruise control, does that mean you were, you were happy to let circumstances move you on? You were just kind of rolling with it as, as and where it Yeah, went? I was just rolling with it. I was not, or at least pretending not to be stressed out about my grades. And I wasn't. Okay. I didn't, I didn't have any high ambitions. <laughs> there was to, no pretending. You just were stressed out about your grades. <laughs> uh, and I didn't have anybody, like my parents weren't pushing me for that. I wasn't okay. pushing myself for that. I didn't feel like that fit the persona that I was building as a teenager to push myself for that. You know, just smoking joints, hanging out, being chill. 
I know I, 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 well, this might make me feel old, but from a vocabulary, and no, I don't know, I'm no, not no, even no. trying to use real cool vocabulary. It's just what I was doing. You grungily, grungily plodding along. You, uh, you, there are, I know students exactly like you. I teach students exactly like you. Yeah. And I was not trying to get within the top three. I could have mm-hmm. been probably, I mean, without pretension, I probably could have. Uh, there's some grades that, I mean, <clears throat> just for example, <clears throat> Anyway, I, I, I made it as easy as I could have it. <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, and then at some point, we just there was started to be talk, which is much earlier now, apparently talking to other parents, uh, while friends who have kids. But uh, there was some talk on, you know, what do you do after high school? Yeah, after your baccalaureate. And, and yeah. really, the conversation started a few months prior to the end of the last year of school, or maybe the maybe the penultimate, I can't remember. Yeah, not anymore. Um, it's much earlier now. And it's much earlier now, I think. And there's a lot more intense talk. And I was at the at the um, library. Yes. yes. At the library, the school library, yeah, with the yeah. kind of study time. You know, just browsing through a magazine about the future and options and stuff. And I was like, I really don't know what I'm going to do. Mm. Um, and I caught the fact that there was these things of prestigious literary classes. And I was like, oh, I'm a literary student. I like literature, I think. Uh, just like I expected, I would love philosophy. I had a whole thing in my mind because philosophy is taught at the last year's high, for high school in France. Mm. And my option in literature and philosophy made it that I would have eight hours a week of it. And it would be a high coefficient for the baccalaureate. And did you and I, love it? Oh, I was miserably bad at it. I really did not understand well, hang on. at all. You, what you was can be bad. You can be bad, but like I did it. not enjoy it. Uh, okay. Uh, so there was also some some external circumstances that uh, we changed teachers t- three times in the school year. Oh, that's horrible! Oh my um, gosh! And so we didn't have a teacher for a while, and uh, oh. I don't know somebody was sick or what. I don't know what, what the deal was, but there was that. So I had lost complete total mm-hmm. motivation for that class. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought I'd be interested and I was interested in some of the texts, but I, I also realized very quickly, which is a lot of how the French system functions, that nobody was interested in thinking uh, or nobody was interested in what I thought about what we were doing. Mm. But I also, at the same time, didn't have any explanation of what was expected, and the, which is another mm. French education trait. And I don't know how it is in the UK, but if you're not given the keys of how to write an essay, and I think I mentioned this before. I'm not sure. We have. We talked about this before in another yeah. episode. I can't remember. So anyway, I'm now. I, so anyway, I'm just like, I, I should move on in my story because otherwise I'm going to spend the whole time, the whole hour talking about high school. But anyway, so I started putting uh, applications to the, together for these prestigious literary classes, preparatory, yep. preparatory classes. Uh, and the, the one thing on, on that makes me think the teachers must know, I asked my head teacher. So there's a person who's like the head teacher for the class. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I asked him about it, and you see, I remember his look, looking at me, going, "Really, <laughs> film? Are you sure? Do you want to do that?" I mean, he's like, "I don't. I. I mean, I. I fully believe that you have the cap- the capability, but you don't have the grades." Ah, okay. <clears throat> and it's like you should have thought about that. And he didn't tell me that, but he seriously implied that you should have thought about that three years ago, or maybe more, if you wanted to get into these schools, because they look at your, you know, your grades. My I'm, grades I'm, are okay, but they're certainly no by, by no means amazing. I'm I'm that teacher that that does has conversations like that, except I tell people early. I've been called someone right. who shattered, shattered dreams because you're telling people early, but nobody told yeah. me early. Yeah, but also no, but there's there wasn't any conversation, or or if there was, I wasn't listening. That was possible about you know you got to think about what you want to do now because mm. that you, your grades have an impact for what you want to do later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was seventeen. Do you really think I knew when I was fifteen? I didn't know when I was twenty. I know. I well, yeah, exactly. And this is what I find frustrating about the. I still don't know to a school. I, I yeah. question myself, but now I have a fifteen-year-old. I've, I've been in a career for 15, 15, 16 years. Yeah, that I do enjoy. That might evolve or change again, but uh, overall, I'm. I'm. You know, it's not that I'm not comfortable with who I am. It's that I also am the kind of person that is going to keep questioning what I'm doing and where I'm going and, you know, until 
forever. And, I, and that's why I think I those moments kind of move you onto a different path. Yeah, so, so that, I've alluded that to whole person, experience so. where you applied. So and then... that whole experience was one side, and then I was turned down everywhere. Yep. Uh, and I, I also had to put in a, a wish for university. Okay. Uh, so because those prep classes are not university, and university is your fallback. Mm -hmm. In this case, in that scenario. Um, and I really didn't know. And I literally realized that I needed to put in wishes for what I would study if I didn't get those classes for university at mm -hmm. a moment where I was just filling something in on the Minitel, the, like the ancestor of the internet mm -hmm. on the summer. And I was scrolling down a list of uh, study topics. I really had no idea. And I saw cinema and I was like, oh, I, I like movies. I, want, I could be a movie. I could be a great film director. <laughs> Oh my God, it's so Pretty different. Pretty much, I'm experience. exaggerating, but not by much. It's just no, but that's it's so different to me. That's why I'm like, oh my and God. you can imagine. Okay. So, and my, there's no input from my parents on this. It's whatsoever. There's just they're they're not there. Okay. I mean, the, my parents are very much there, but they were not people who were just behind my back for my studies whatsoever. Okay. So I had a lot of moral support on a lot mm -hmm. of different stuff from my parents and emotional support and growth. And they were there to talk, but they were like, you know, just do whatever you want. Just, I, I don't know. I'm exaggerating, but not by much. <laughs> you had lots of freedom to explore, right? Which you did, which clearly yeah. you did. And you do. So you, I studied I cinema. You that. So I studied cinema and, uh, and I still had no idea about my career. Right. <clears throat> but... So a few things happen. So oh, it's funny because I start, I'm starting early, and I know that I'm detailing stories that might not have a huge bearing on, but don't sound like they have a huge bearing, but they do. At least I think the thing that is useful to share for any young people is that I really had no idea what I was doing, which yeah. I think is entirely normal. Yes. And I yes. also believe that while it's good to talk about what you want to do, there is an enormous amount of pressure for people to figure out what they should be doing. And I saw this yes. talk a few weeks ago uh, on TED by uh, Emily Wepnick, which, uh, on, um, which is a ridiculous word, multi-potentialites. People who don't, people who, their problem is not that they, they don't know what one thing they should be doing, they're interested in tons. They're doing a lot of yeah. different things. <laughs> yeah, that, that's also called careers. scanners. Scanners is another term for that. Yeah, Barbara because multi, Schreier, fortunately, because right, multi-potentialites is a horrible name. Yeah, I don't uh, know. Which she name. makes jokes of in the talk, but anyway. Uh, and the talk was not surprising. Uh, it was just, so my point here is that, that while it's probably good to talk about what you're going to be doing, and we shared uh, Yuval Noah Harari's video on, and he's not the only one to talk about the fact that mm -hmm. things are going to be changing uh, more and more in the 21st century on changing jobs, changing landscapes, and the mm. ability to be able to reinvent yourself and mm. adapt yourself to what's mm. needed and what's mm. going on in the job market, essentially, mm. is going to be key as more and more jobs are automated. Um, and uh, back then, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, so I think, so and yeah, my point, my point was, I, I think it's good that we talk about what you could be doing, but there's an enormous amount of pressure on like, you should know. And we mm. don't, you know, people don't know what they want to be doing. We figure it out by trying. We figure it out by learning. And, and a think, lot of times in, in theoretical university academic learning, there's still like very little idea of what you could be doing with this. Learning. And that's what some people do. They'll, they'll do a master's and put off making a choice. But there's a little nugget in what you said. And I think it will relate to the next story you're going to tell, because I, I can remember some of the things you said before, is trying stuff, doing stuff. Doing stuff can be a way of discovering what what you would like to do yeah. uh, certainly what my sister did that's not so much what i did but the there's after you started studying cinema you weren't massively you got into it but you I was really was, into it the first year yeah i enjoyed it uh and i started a first part-time job at the same time the second year uh, yeah yeah i started yeah. getting a little bit bored of it and i didn't like it as much mm -hmm. um which I guess that's one thing for me that I'm still working on. I get bored from things. Um, and then I had to start over because in the second semester of the second year, I failed a bunch of the modules. Mm -hmm. 
things are built in modules in the French system and you have to acquire and succeed at a bunch at a number of modules to be able to get your to pass the year. Mm -hmm. And so I, I passed all of them in the first semester or enough and then almost none in the second semester because I found more interesting to go work in a bar and I was working at night and I just I, I messed up a bunch of classes. But um, working in a bar you meet people you discover things you'll probably around lots of like oh it was other... exciting yeah it was very exciting it was very exciting and uh <clears throat> well that was already one defining moment mm -hmm. to have that experience to work in a bar to go full on into it to go out at night to be trained to be well first i was scooping ice cream then i made friends with people at the bar at the bar uh itself uh because it was a bar and restaurant Mm -hmm. And uh, it was known for cocktails. So there was, I mm. wanted to learn of cocktails and I wanted to learn how to like, you know, just to act like juggle bottles, the flair, uh, which I did uh, a little bit. Not much, I was not doing anything oh, wow. extraordinary with the bottles. I, but I learned a I bunch of cocktails. That. Wow. Um, and I did just a tiny bit of flair, maybe really not much, just like throwing a bottle like that. You know, like that. Um, and then I went to New York for a summer thinking I wanted to go study. And then I realized that. I got homesick after two months. I did a bunch of odd jobs in random areas of New York. I was like, I worked in a warehouse, in a, in a like a, just a big, 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 cheap store in Jamaica, mm. Queens. I, I was helping out in a house in the Hamptons, just helping out for, while I was cooking and cleaning in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, and I realized I was not 21. I technically couldn't drink. I am an American citizen, but I was waking, waiting for my social security paperwork. So I, I couldn't really work in the meantime. So it's kind of just mm -hmm. basically doing, working a little bit illegally here and there, uh, hosted by friends of my parents and, uh, and a friend that I used to work with at the bar was hanging out. So there was a lot of big dreams about bartending, but I got to have a taste of the nightlife mm -hmm. and the life of working in hospitality and, and restaurants. Mm -hmm. which is and, and and my brothers work in it and it's, it's a crazy world if mm -hmm. you don't know you should well that's particularly on chefs there's more than one book but kitchen confidential both by anthony Baudin is a good one for the world of chefs in particular but the world of hospitality mm -hmm. altogether uh, it's a fun read as well uh from a what, an amazing character that we're very very yeah. sadly committed suicide yeah but, amazing character um but it's a crazy it's a crazy life so mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I, my life was centered around my colleagues. I had an enormous amount of fun. I was making money, mm -hmm. but I was living at night, not seeing any of my other friends. So you you you're in a you live in a parallel universe of its own making. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that made me think. Wait, I so and the trip to New York. And so well, first I was like, I need to pull myself out of this thing. I was like, I did a few. Um, but almost a year of it and I was full on. And then I was like, because there was talk among the people that were there and I was working for with a lot of people who were older. It also got me thinking, wait, what do I want? Cause uh, I don't, I don't think this is the career I'm looking for. And the career progression of this is what is, if you want to be a bartender, there's like young years, maybe be a restaurant manager, but what else is there? Um, and I'm not sure this works for me because I'm not seeing anybody. I'm only, I love the people I work with and I love hanging out with them. And I love going out at late dinners and late drinks until four or five or six in the morning because we finish at three or four and then yeah. you want to hang out. Mm. Um, and uh, so anyway, the trip to the States came back. Uh, I hung out for a few months. I was just not doing much until my mom said, you got to go to work now. You've got to do something. Was this so, the bookshop? Yeah. I got I started working at a bookshop mm. so I was like okay well I need to I need another just regular standard job mm. uh I like books I like reading so again there's another the only thing is just like well, I seem to like this thing let's try that let's go in that direction I think I could find a job at a bookstore it must be you know must be possible and I did I found a job at a big bookstore which is a minimum wage normal normal job mm -hmm. now this story you do mention uh, in our teaser about this season and I, th I think this is a, an important story about oh, yeah, you working in the bookshop. So that's a big, uh, so there's a couple of things and I, I'm, I'm probably mixing the order in which they happen, but I'm sure that that's, that big event is, is uh, uh, something that affected my career, like in mm. the way the question was asked. Sorry, well, I know we're, we're getting around to it after 30 minutes, sorry. But all relevant. One thing that I realized starting to work over there 
was that um, just talking to Pete colleagues who had been there for 10 years or more, mm. a few of them were young like me, but a few of them mm -hmm. had been around for a long time. And after two, three months, I was like, I feel like I, I understand this place now. I don't, you know, there's not much else for me to learn, really. Um, and now, there's also some arrogance of, there's definitely arrogance of me to generally think that I've got the handle of something after a short amount of time, just to be open about that. Um, but looking at, and this might sound mean, but looking at, I was 21, 21, mm. yeah. And looking at people who are way older than me, somebody mm. probably pushing 35 to 40 mm. been there for 10 15 years still doing exactly the same thing i was doing which was just like receptioning books putting them away you know that stuff ordering them and i was like wait a minute and and probably not making much more than the minimum wage i was on mm. i mean i'm sure he had regular he had, of course had a regular job and pension and all that but just and i was like wait a minute do i want to do this for 15 years no Mm -hmm. I don't want to do this for 15 years. And there's no career progression on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do like the books, but actually I just learned after three months that the biggest thing that everybody said was a big deal was ordering books, reordering mm -hmm. and meeting with the publishers. And I did it. I got to sit in in a meeting with the publishers and I got to use the computer and basically just you sell the book, reorder one. And then when there's a new release of a book, you look at how the, that author sold previously or you want to take a risk and... You know, but how big a risk? They won't tell you. They won't let you take big risks, uh, and it doesn't make sense to you anyway. Mm. So you're like, okay, I'll order five, or two, or one, or ten. If it's a big author, ten. Or if it's a much bigger author, then perhaps more than that. But then probably there's somebody else getting into the decision anyway. So I was like, I don't think this is going to work out. I mean, it's working out now, but I started getting interested in like, what else should I be doing? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and so. This is where I, I don't know the chronology of things because I can't remember. It all happened within the space of a couple of months. Oh, wow. Well, I, I was working there for three, four months. That's it. So I started looking at, I, I got to meet other colleagues, yeah. looked at how long they were working, started burgeoning the idea that, okay, this is <clears throat> what else could I be doing? Because like, I, I don't know. And I'd given up on the cinema studies, or I was like, should I go back to that? Should I complete it? But I didn't really like it. Uh, and um, uh, on one end, I had one of my oldest friends who was, uh, who I was talking with, who told me, like, you told me that you're interested in graphic design. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one of my best friends started a graphic design school because he was, he completed his, his other degree in geography, but he was like, I don't, you know, like a lot of kids after university, you're like, all right, well, that was interesting, but what, what am I supposed to do with a degree in history, geography, literature, or whatever? <clears throat> um, and and a bunch of my new students and masters are that are in that kind of scenario as well. Mm -hmm. They did bachelors mm -hmm. in English, literature, mm -hmm. history, and they're like, that was interesting, but uh, mm -hmm. I, maybe I should learn something to get into some kind of career path. Mm -hmm. um, and where I'm teaching is meant to be a lot more practical to a, a to a career destination while in the world of marketing and communications at least there's like a given world yeah um and uh <clears throat> and then the other big thing that happened is that one morning so i was living with my parents in the 19th in paris and one morning i went to work just as usual and my mom showed up near lunchtime mm. i was like hey mom what are you doing here and she's like so don't get upset or anything i'm like well we're okay we're in the middle of the floor with customers and everything yeah uh, i mean the just bookstore it's a big bookstore um but she says we don't we i can't remember how she says it, but basically we've just been evicted mm -hmm. so she's like i i we don't so the we don't have an apartment anymore we don't have a home we don't have a home anymore and i don't even mm -hmm. know how to say that it's just so we've had I've, we've had other events like it growing up uh, that were rough but the weirdness for this one and it, it was traumatic for my little sister because she was there and the police came and it was just it was a whole wow. um but i what i it's funny because this happened several times i had the same experience about my dad last year i had the surreal experience and i just left normal life because i in the just morning got up left in the morning yeah. 
and then my mom shows up at work still normal and she's like so i've organized you can go you're gonna go sleep at your friend jean baptiste we're gonna go sleep at other friends of ours so she my mom had organized for us to be placed at multiple spots but i didn't go back there was no home to go back to in the evening Uh, and I happened to go sleep with my friend Jean Baptiste, who's the one who is also he was in a work study program with a company that uh, and our conversation, I think that's also how it happened. Our conversations after that, because I was staying at his place for a few weeks, uh, were about what well, the future also. And that made me that was a big, big, big mm. wake up call in growing mm. up, being adults, mm. fearing mm. for myself or the need to fare for myself. Mm. And to look at, okay, well, what am I going to do for this? Mm. What am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do? Uh, yeah. Just all together. So things that happened that threw my career in a particular situation and in a particular direction, that was one big one. And moreover, so they're, they're movers. They got all the stuff into a, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Removal van? Yeah, but you the storage place, the storage place. Oh, okay, yeah, in storage. Right. Uh, on top of that, to add, add insult to injury, my checkbook was there and uh, the movers just stole my money. And like, I was, I, I had to deal with the whole fraud problem afterwards. Wow. They used my checks to pay for stuff. And so I had to handle a whole bunch of stuff with the bank uh, at the same time that I was homeless, basically. <laughs> technically homeless of course we're very lucky that i have friends to stay with and everything but so those kind of <clears throat> there's a couple of things i want to point out in everything mm-hmm. you said there's a and i'm going to reframe that whole thinking about the future thing is also the listening to you you were <laughs> i can't believe i'm about to say this but it sounds very role-playing game you were on a quest for mastery i don't know about a quest for mastery because some that's mastery is something that i that eludes me but I think but I on think my, that, that and that's, that's your what focus. I was saying earlier about I changed my mind and I I don't commit all the way to mastery. I just I like, get bored a little bit and then yeah. But 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 I would say that listening to you talk about it, the way you think about the future, the way your if, if things happen, and then in your response to them, you're think you're always like thinking about the future and what's next and interested in learning stuff and what follow what you're interested in. To me. I think that is there's an inspiring amount of willingness to trust and be free to go with life in a way that I never experienced. Right. And I could just, it's it just true that what I don't definitely. realize in the bubble I live in is that there's something else that I could be doing. Mm. It's entirely possible that a lot of people would have gone, well, I have nothing, but I have this job. At least I have that. And this is something I should hang on to. Whereas mm. I went the other way around and I said, no, I, I, this job is a dead end. I need to go somewhere else. That kind of exploration and adventure. And I, 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 I think, call it, call it. A so that mastery. somewhere else was, um, thanks to my friends. So it turned out, I was like, okay, graphic design is something that mm. I'm interested in that should be mm-hmm. creative, that could, mm-hmm. is going to lead me somewhere, that there's a career path. There's a lot of job opportunities or something. It's, um, it sounds interesting. Um, but the school that my friend James was doing is very expensive, but there was another program offered by the same school of a work study program, uh, that was free. If I, if I had the job, Mm -hmm. well, free, it was just, there was a government support stuff. Mm -hmm. So if I showed up to the school and say, I have a job and I have an employer and, uh, then I would be able to get into the school. Okay. So then my other friend, which he said was staying with, said, well, actually, we're looking for the company where I'm doing my work study program in business it has a small studio and they're looking for a, an apprentice. So you could do an apprenticeship there. So that's what I did. So then <clears throat> my parents moved into a new apartment. I stayed there for a few more weeks, but I organized to find my first apartment, the studio, yep. uh, and get into the school and work on an apprenticeship. So, and I was earning less than minimum wage because mm. that, that's how the apprenticeship works. You're, you're just working, I was kind of earning, I think half or maybe 60% of the minimum wage, mm-hmm. working four days a week and one day equivalent. So I was one, like one week of studying, three weeks of work, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, which I really enjoyed. And I found that I really liked that as a, as a structure a lot yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. And I really yeah. enjoyed the, the practical, teaching 
and I really enjoyed learning on the job and getting to learn as I was doing. I really, really liked that a yeah, lot more you're, than you're, the academical and theoretical stuff. You're and I love in, reading in and I love the theory, end. but oh yeah, thrown in the deep end for sure. <laughs> and struggling to, well, I'm just like, you know, just surviving off of not much. Uh, so I had less money than if I had stayed in the book bookstore, but mm -hmm. my intention was that on the long run, I am aiming for something and I'm building something that is yeah. worthwhile. Yeah. Even though yeah, what's yeah. going on right now is on a day to day, I was like, I don't know how to make ends meet. And I'm just basically eating ramen every day. Pasta. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but that's okay. I was 21, you know. Uh, and it's true that there's certainly that kind of willingness to put things back into to gamble. What might look like a gamble to others, but never looked like a gamble to me. But you were a big risk, big risk to risk a lot. Just yeah. so similarly, a year, two years later, so I finished the, the certification, there's professional certification, it's not even considered to be a degree in France. It is, but it isn't. It's not a university diploma, so it's not yeah. it's like okay. you know, fairly considered. Uh, they, my employer that I was apprenticing with offered me a really good job with a lot yep. of money yep. for my age and for my position. Uh, I took it. And then a few months later, so it was a small studio. I was learning with somebody who was self-taught. Mm. I felt I've learned everything I can from you. And I don't. And I don't, I want to work, I want to learn more and I want to work in a different kind of environment. Mm. And also I was commuting out of Paris and I was really bored of it. Right. Um, and uh, I resigned, which is mental for most people. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> and there's certainly a, a yes. there's, there's certainly a, a, a side where you could think and Pro and would be right in thinking I'm massively arrogant. You come from nowhere. You have no family. You don't have a degree. You really think you're going to find better than this? But I did. <laughs> yeah, I did exactly. believe that. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't find better than that, and I quickly was disenchanted after I left because I realized in the real job world that it was very difficult. That I didn't really have the right kind of school, the right kind of qualifications even the right kind of skill set. And I was struggling for several months and I had to take odd jobs on the side to make ends meet. Um, and I was like, I was seriously thinking this was a massive mistake. And you're like early 20s here. Yeah. I was 21, 22, 22. I was, was that it was when I was uh, 22. Yeah. Was that when you came to England? Well, that was later. Uh, that it? was later. Uh, because was moving years later. Because the moving countries thing, the willingness to to learn or thinking you've learned and then wanting to push yourself or move on to another that I mean, you call it arrogance. I don't know. I've, I've heard people call me and think that I'm arrogant. And I think and I understand why some people may think that. And sometimes I right. am. Right. And, and that's, I have that trait. That's your willingness to own what you're like and be responsible for. You know, you can be this way. Yeah, because I. I I mean, I also see it as just like you're just on one massive adventure constantly. I, I like okay. yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks to my sister. My sister was working in a, a, a so something that barely exists today, which is funny. It still exists a little bit, but a CD, CD and DVD shop. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, DVDs, and they, they were selling cheap DVDs. It was booming at the time. It was cheap DVDs. Yeah. Um, to, and I was doing just a few hours of work in there while I was actively working for work, uh, looking for work. Mm. And I think we mentioned on this this uh, show before the personal development courses that we've done mm. uh, at Landmark. Mm. And the Landmark Forum is the big one. And I knew about them. Uh, I have done. I had done courses with them. Um, and I knew them very. I knew about them, and I knew them well, pretty well. And at that time, because I had some time, or and also because of just like bumped into a, a friend and he was like you should you haven't done anything with us and so just come in and participate uh so i went to volunteer for a few classes and i think i participated in a seminar and i got really i i, I reconnected with the fact that i really really enjoy those courses and mm. i um i had done a few beforehand uh also because my mom knows a lot about them and participated and led courses and i was trained to uh to lead to lead seminars as well and uh, one thing leading to another, 
I found out that there was a position open in Paris. And so that was completely different and nothing to do with graphic design, but I was like, <laughs> I'll just put an application for it. Why not? I'm looking for a job. I need a job. Yeah. And I had a phone interview and well, I had, a, I had an interview and uh, yeah, anyway, and that was offered a job. I was offered a job to manage the production and events and finances for mm -hmm. uh, the office in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, which was a small office. There was four employees and uh, four, yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, so I completely changed career, my career going in a completely different direction because I started participating in those personal development seminars again. And I realized how much I loved them and people got a lot of value out of them. And I was like, mm. maybe this is what I should be doing. Mm. Or, but I could be doing this. So I'll just, you know, and I was not having a lot of luck on my interviews. And I really was like just behind on some bills and stuff. So I just went to that. Um, and I changed the jobs within that. So actually several times, three times, three times in three years. So within. So I started on the finance Lamar. and production side. Yeah. And then the company, the, the office in Paris was downsized a little bit. Yeah. And somebody left and I was replaced and I replaced, I took over their job to, uh, to manage the business, manage the, uh, but sales and registrations essentially yeah to get yeah. people into the programs mm -hmm. uh so that was moving from managing my you know the relationship with the accountants managing the money booking the rooms that kind of stuff uh mm -hmm. there's some hilarious stories because i, I met up with my um, manager from back then many years later we happened to be living in singapore at the same time anyway there's funny stories i bought a photocopier that was one of the like, amazing things <laughs> I was not supposed to buy a photocopier. <laughs> I was twenty-two, and I got I got the manager to sign on to something, that, and they cashed the check, which was not part of the plan. And it was an enormous amount of money for the for the office that was not. We were supposed to lease a copier, I think, and instead of that, we bought it. You bought it. Oh wow! <laughs> something that doesn't really exist anymore. The massive photocopier. Although no, it does. Of course, it exists in offices. Anyway. Oh yeah, um, we've got two. And then you they wanna... closed the office in Paris, which was another massive thing that happened that completely shifted my career in a different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so they so first it was downsized to a smaller office, and then uh, and then a little bit later closed. So I was told that well. Um, and, and this is, again, there were other circumstances that were coincidental at the same time. So my older brother, who's much older, is a chef, and he was uh, working in New York for many years. And he had just moved to London mm -hmm. a few months before. And I went to visit him in London in the brand new restaurant. That's where he got his first Michelin star. Uh, and, uh, and then a month after I go visit him for a weekend, I'm told that the office is closed, so they're technically letting me go. However, there is a role for me in the office in London if I want it. So you're like, yeah, why not? But, well, yeah, but yeah, but it's not as light as that. It was a big no. deal. It was super yeah, upsetting yeah. that the whole place was closing down. Yeah, it was super upsetting that uh, there's a whole surrounding thing that the business wasn't working. Mm. Uh, which was really difficult at the time. Um, but the fact that we were downsizing offices already, there was a bunch of stuff that happened that just made it really rough. Mm. Uh, and I loved that job at the time. I really, really enjoyed it. I had, I was earning a lot of money. I was working hard, working long hours, but earning really good money for 22 year olds, mm. 22, 23. Uh, by that, by then I was, and I was turning to, I was about to turn 25. It was the, the summer of my 24th to 25th birthday. And um, and that's so when you came. Me, that's when I came to London. Right. So to be told uh, that, uh, of all that, I was like, just. And, and of course, it happened fast. I was like, you have the, yeah. you have a job in London if you want it, and you, but you, they need you there in two weeks. If you oh. take it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's not like <laughs> oh, just take three months and think about it. No, no, it's happening now. We're closing the office right now. You have, you know, if you stay here, you have a, you have all the stuff that you're needed under French law, which is, you know, I don't, I don't know how many months of pay and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you have an obvious, a different job again, with different responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, managing what's called their, their family division. So there's courses for teens and for young people and an, mm -hmm. another set of courses because the London office is much bigger than in Paris. Um, 
And anyway, I took it. So the fact that my brother was over there and the fact that I had just right. visited London a month before and right. the fact that a lot of things were changing in Paris, that I was really enjoying it, but that was part of it. So if I was no mm. longer doing no longer doing that job, I was really like, I don't know what else I'm going to be doing. And am I going to be struggling again like I was before I found the job two years ago? Mm. Mm -hmm. So it all happened very fast, but there were some of those concerns. Mm. And I thought, you know what, just let's take it. Mm. I'll go in two weeks. Mm. So for a long time, I felt also that I really was pushing forward to another adventure, but also felt weird about abandoning. I wasn't, I mean, quote unquote, right? Just leaving so fast. Yeah. So I completely changed my life. And, then, and but then I, I left a lot of my friends, my friend circles, all of that stuff I left behind. It was, it was weird. That's a big, yeah, I, yeah. I never appreciated that until you just said that you you left that life you built the friends the routines the people yeah. and came to a new country and it, I did it, that it, several times in my life yeah wow the, and, in, I, and um, I, it's it's what's weird and I was thinking about that this weekend again because I had a lot of thoughts at the moment around it uh so most most people so I fit most with people who are just like random travelers who've been around like me, of course. I mean, I have friends who stuck to the same spots and I, I'm friends that were friends back then. I do see again now occasionally, but they yeah. live in the suburbs. They have kids. They've never gone anywhere. We just yep. don't have that much shared experience. In this case, we have a shared hobby because we like playing mm. games. And so it's nice to see them to play games. But it's about the only thing, I mean, exaggerating, it's not the only thing we share, that we're friends so we can hang out. But um, but I don't have that one circle that I built either around my studies. The vast majority of people have got their circle of friends that they've built around uh, high school, university, first few jobs, yeah. and living in the same spot. Yeah. yeah. Well, roughly in the same spot. Then yeah. the... I don't know what the, the percentages are, but not a lot of people actually just uproot. Now, there's more people that do that now than before, of course, because we have yeah. global travel and global. But anyway, so that's how I moved to London. And I was so 25. A, I there's, just turned so, 25. So there's a few. It's worth just reiterating a few things. So there was the. the so no, no, really... we've, we've, we're almost at an hour. And I told you about two big, at least two big events that no, turned no, no, in different directions. And fine. we're still not at my strategy. Career. That's fine. We'll get there. We'll get there. So there's the not really knowing what you wanted to do, shifting from uh, the secondary school to university studies, considering yeah. what's next. There's the the getting a job, the bookshop, the not really starting to think about what you really wanted to do and mastery and that twinge of arrogance. There, there's there's certainly that, been impetus. The realizing Sorry, that you have you. to, yeah, there's the realizing that you actually have to do something where you can earn money and take care of yourself there's the and and, and not get bored quickly also and, my and drive. yeah and then that's the that, i need I think, something to this going to challenge me and i need it to yeah be i think that's the that's one of the really interesting things that, under, that underlies it like that willingness to if i'm going to get bored i need to find something new but also the continual learning the 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 thing that i'm also and, getting and there's also just a thing like this isn't it yeah but the thing I'm also getting from what you're saying is that mm -hmm. the, if you're working and learning at the same time, that's really important for you. Yeah. The constant exploration and learning yes. and being doing something practical. Theory is pointless. Just working is pointless because you're not learning. Yes. But both together is kind of how they is, is the sweet spot. So the, then there's the moving those country jobs, several I times. For, when I was working in coaching and training and development with Landmark, I was massively challenged, thrown in the yeah. deep end, yep. trained all the time. Yep. Uh, and uh, working, I mean, the fact that it, I know it's not that I was working along, I really loved it. It was rough. Yeah. It was tough at times. Yeah. It was very tough at times. But very, but very In a really, really rewarding way. Yeah. I was working with people and coaching them and working in an environment where people were looking at, you know, better, look, better um, understanding themselves, uh, yeah. reaching and pursuing results or stuff that they that were big challenges to them. I, it's, very, it's even difficult to explain. I'm fine. It's, it it's is. Funny I'm talking I, I know what you mean, but. because I mean, that's how that's how we initially connected in London is through our mutual friends through participating in Landmark. And the, yeah. the quality of the conversation, the quality of the training that they do, I think is 
second to none. I think it's amongst the best in the world that you could get. And certainly in terms of challenge and leadership and growth and all of that. Yeah. So all of that willingness. So you're in London. Yeah. We kind of start to get to know each other a little bit. And then, yeah. and then the, because the, so the, the so thing London was really rough. The thing, was, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so the, the thing that's missing now to really round off this conversation, I think there's two things, yeah. is how you got from working in London to your career as a brand strategist. Yeah. And then so, the other thing is my conventional career path that can be explained in less than two minutes. <laughs> And that will round off That'll round this off episode. the conversation, I think, yes. Yeah. Um, so, so you're in London. So I'm in London, and very quickly, I'm not enjoying myself. Okay, yeah. I, and the whole experience of what I just described in Paris that was uh, long hours, but really challenging, rewarding, learning a lot, uh, hanging with my friends, making good money, for, my, for me at that age anyway was completely different in london in london wow. it was long hours in yeah. but uh, that occurred at as really difficult really mm -hmm. exhausting mm -hmm. really painful mm -hmm. uh i very quickly was not enjoying myself was resenting mm -hmm. my job resenting mm -hmm. myself was felt like i didn't have enough money to enjoy myself in the same way that i did in paris mm -hmm. um and, and it just wasn't working. And after several months, I was just, I was depressed, honestly. Mm. Uh, and then the other thing is that my friend James, who was a designer, had moved to China just a little bit before I moved to London. Okay. Uh, and the moving to London also just to work that idea that I wanted to go travel. And, I, and, and being in London, ah. there's more people that come yeah. from Australia that yeah, go on year-long uh, gap years. Things that is was not as common in France back then. It's more common mm -hmm. now. Um, but so, and also London being a cosmopolitan, huge cities with people coming from all over the place, learning a lot mm -hmm. that I really enjoyed. And I got more into the idea that I want to go travel. Mm. Uh, and so, so after nearly a year, I had several conversations with my management over uh, at Landmark and the fact that I wasn't happy and I, and I and I just we tried some stuff on just you know changing and the work I, I decided I wanted to go travel and that I should leave yeah. so I, I resigned yeah. I I didn't resign I, and it was not a one day to the next thing like a, a little bit more. I mean all of this was considered I spent a lot of time overthinking everything yeah by the way so just to make sure that it doesn't sound like those decisions are so sometimes it's sudden, like the we were evicted and didn't have a house anymore. That's not mm. out of my decision. But when I've made choices to leave a job, to resign, to move country, it was very considered. Mm. At some point, you still have to take the risk or you don't mm -hmm. have to. But you, mm -hmm. I, I did. But mm -hmm. I, I tend to overthink everything. So I spent a lot of time talking with people about it and looking. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the same for that job. And I, and, and I had a three month um, notice period. Mm -hmm. So I made sure that within the three months, notice, so I had a bunch of conversations with my managers mm -hmm. about the fact that I would be leaving and why and how it sat and, and that I would uh, make sure that all of my results were in order and that my department was in order to hand it over to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I, I did it with, uh, with honor, I guess. Uh, I, I think that's awesome. Uh, it was not like, and, and that was really important to me at the time, because I, yeah. as I said, I was, I felt like I was failing. Yeah. So the fact that for the last few months, I turned things around so that it wasn't necessarily like a massive success and I'm proud of myself, but I was proud of myself to say, okay, well, this is not working for me anymore, but everybody's supporting me so that I can put things in the right order and have the right results mm -hmm. to hand mm -hmm. it over to somebody else who's going to feel up for it. Mm -hmm um if that hopefully that makes sense i think I yeah know, i think that makes sense uh so anyway i left and uh and then i was like okay well i need to make money fast mm. Mm. uh what should i do because I, I i knew that i wanted to go back to and this is the story i think i say I, I i talk about regularly and this is the way i talk about that career and i'll go a little bit faster than the next couple but i knew i wanted to go back towards communication marketing something but I, not as a designer because I didn't design and I hadn't designed anything for three years. For three years, and honestly, I don't. I don't think it was that good. 
uh, I wasn't, and I didn't practice all that much, and uh, certainly not in those three years. And I like to think that I have a creative mind, but I was like looking for how to apply it. And at the same time, needed to make money fast. And I had three people independent from one another tell me, ask me if I thought about doing recruitment. The first one was my sister-in-law, and I was like, I don't even know what that is. And she was in sales, and she's like, recruiting is a big thing in London. There's money to be made, and I think you're really good with people. So it's a people thing. I was like, is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and I didn't know about it. So I started looking, at it, and I saw there was a lot of job ads for recruitment because it happens to be a sales job in which there's a high level of commission and, sl- and low salary and a huge churn, which uh, I didn't turnover, know at the time. Yeah. Huge turnover, <clears throat> yeah. so there's a lot of jobs for that. And for young people my age, right? Perfect. Um, and, uh, and, and I also didn't know what I would be doing in marketing communication. So I was like, I needed something else fast. So I did a few interviews. I was first told that I was, didn't have the right kind of profile because I didn't have the aggressive, aggressive, ag- aggressivity, aggressivity, aggressive? aggression, aggression, like aggression, that kind of like go, go getter. They didn't there. And I did a test, a, a, like a psychometric <laughs> test. And they were like, yeah, you don't, you should not pursue a career in recruitment. You're not going to, you're not interested. And I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'll prove you wrong. Um, and I found a, <laughs> an agency that I enjoyed the conversations and they mm-hmm. had on their, and they were called, they are called, but they still exist, creative personnel. Uh, so they said they're hiring people for the communications industry, uh, marketing, product, uh, audio, video production, and video games. Which I was like, that sounds super cool. That's like what I want to do. Sure <laughs> thing. I'll learn. I hopefully my plan is I will learn about these industries, find out where I could fit, meet people, network, make some money while I'm doing it, and I can use this as a stepping stone. That's see that. Which I didn't tell anybody that plan. There. there was vaguely, vaguely not. I didn't even say so because it sounds insane to most people. Even though that is totally uh, a plan. That is totally what a way of creating career. So that's what I did. I found out after six months that a lot of, I can't remember, did I tell that story on the podcast? I told you before, sure, I know. I found out can't after remember. six months and making, uh, like starting to, you know, it takes you a while. You connected to get... people, you doing well, right? Yeah, I did really well. And I, I have people who acknowledge and like told me how grateful they were not, like oh, yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah. For jobs I found back then that was 18 years ago 17 years ago mm. um now of course i didn't do it for a lot of people but i did specialize in 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 building relationship and finding the right person in the right job mm-hmm. and finding little like gems of people who didn't know how to present themselves but were mm-hmm. really really good at what they did mm-hmm. um and uh and yeah i found out there was a bet going on of how long i would last that <laughs> when i showed up all my colleagues were like that guy's not gonna last and we're in an environment of hardcore salesmen who who love uh and like love the glenn gary glenn ross and yeah. they always be closing alec baldwin famous speech that i really i've never watched. seen that film i know i should watch it you should watch it and the <laughs> boiler room have you seen the boiler room no i heard about it again i know i need to watch it so i watched those movies when i was over there now yeah both of those movies are funnily enough about their, and those are revered by most hardcore sales environments, revered movies. Hmm. And most of them are, they're, they're dicks, the people in those movies. Yeah. The majority they're of them. They're not nice. They're not nice. And they're, and they're, um, they're crooks. Yeah. Anyhow. So, uh, but those, the, the, the colleagues like apologized and said, well, actually, okay, so you've proven that you actually can do the job. We have no <laughs> idea what you're doing, but it's working. <laughs> Um, and I made enough contacts and I made some money and I, I went traveling for a bit, uh, just shorter trips than I thought I would at first or that I wanted to at first. And, uh, and I stayed there for just over two years, saved enough money, stopped, resigned. Uh, when I, I felt like I had enough money to reinvent myself and have a few months of, cause I knew it would take a while. And it was a big risk again, because it's very mm. difficult to get into the advertising industry. And not only that, mm. that's when I found out about the job of strategic planning or account planning or strategy. Mm. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Mm. And of course, it's the most difficult, just by virtue of there being the least, that's the least amount of people who do that job. There, those are tiny departments or no departments. A lot of agencies don't have that department. 
because it's a, a bit of a luxury to have a dude that's there. Yeah, this is the guy who thinks for us. Um, that's his specialty. Everybody else thinks, <laughs> but we we pay him just or her just for that. Um, of ideas and thinking. That's it. Ideas and thinking. I'm exa- I'm just I'm summing up the job. There's a lot more to be said about that. Uh, and I went traveling around around China because I wanted to go and hang out with my friend James, which I did the year before. I took a, sab- a short sabbatical from my job in recruitment. And I went around the world for five weeks with him, uh, which was another completely different story and adventure. And then I went again to China and I read a bunch of stuff about branding and marketing. And I started my mm. blog and I started meeting people and networking and uh, until somebody would give me a chance. Now, this, this is another, this is one of the stories. That's a whole other it? big story. Yes. This no, is no. True. But the, the key bit about taking, a, someone took a risk on you. Mm-hmm. You, but you, because you I, to I managed to you. get a bunch of uh, interviews, and I thought at first that my contacts that I recruited for would be useful mm. uh, when I talked. But then I quickly realized that most of those people who saw me as a recruiter could not shake, like, get their head around me moving yep. to something else. Yep. Completely different. Yep. yep. And I, 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 I had a client who still years later was like, but. You found us great people. Why are you not doing recruitment? Uh, and I was like, but no, I've been a strategist for several years. It's like, I don't, still don't understand what that is. <laughs> I'm like, what? Okay. Uh, he, and that guy's a designer. He does a lot of strategy. They, 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 it's a great studio. It's now become a big studio, us two. Uh, they do games and, uh, and a lot of really high-end design, interface design. Wow. And they were just four people when I started recruiting for them. They had never worked with a recruiter before. And I found them some just great people. Anyway, um, so I needed to go out of that. And so I was interviewing and then the other, so I had the people who saw me as a recruiter and were like, I don't see you as something else. Of course, they didn't tell me that openly, but that's pretty much all, except for that one guy who told me openly, who was, yeah. who was a lot of fun. But I enjoyed the fact that that guy was you know crazy enough to talk openly. Uh, but then, but that helped me realize that I was like, oh, those other people who are being polite, that's what's going on. It's, mm. They don't see me as that. Uh, or I had people tell me, no, but to gain strategy, you should start do business and account management for agencies. But I felt like I was 27 and I felt like I've done a lot of sales between my job mm-hmm. at Landmark and my job mm-hmm. as a recruiter. Mm. I've succeeded in some of the most difficult sales mm-hmm. environments mm-hmm. and I don't want to do more client management. I've, mm-hmm. I I know how to do it. I have mm-hmm. that experience. I know I don't know. I know I don't have the experience in advertising, mm-hmm. but my belief was that it's people. It's the same thing. Mm. Now there's specific specificities about learning about a project and communication, but I felt like I could learn on the job. Mm. Uh, so Now, if somebody had offered me a job, I don't know what would have happened because that was also people telling me you should start an account management, but they didn't have a job for me either. So, you know. Okay. Um, And then I interviewed for this one agency at Iris and I showed up for the interview uh, and I met the senior strategist and the person in charge of digital, George Mm -hmm. Nime, who I I interviewed in my podcast, Ice Cream for Everyone as well. And we're still in touch and he has a great agency in Vienna now. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. And he's the kind of maverick that, took a chance takes chances on people mm. that he probably had and he's he has a quite unusual but really really rich career as well super interesting and fascinating guy great guy uh and uh so i had what it was my most surreal interview experience <laughs> i showed up started talking and he's like great 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 this is cool and then he was very interested in asking a lot of questions about but wait a minute you're a recruiter I'm like, well, yeah, I know, but I want to change careers, et cetera. He's like, so you you know a lot of people in London. I was like, well, yeah, sure. I have a portfolio. Of a, he's like, you placed a lot of really good uh, candidates. I was like, yes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so and then he, he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want you to, okay, so this is, I, I like this conversation. So I'd like you to meet someone else. I'm like, okay. So he just leaves and come back. And then that room was not available anymore. So what was like an hour, of 40, what I thought would be a 45 minute to an hour interview if it went well turned into over three hours in a change, two changes of rooms. Cause like we needed to switch cause the room meeting rooms were like booked yeah. and available. Yeah. Met yeah, the yeah. HR comp- person, a bunch of the person in charge of the project management. The person I was like meeting all a creative director who came to talk to me. I was like, <laughs> I don't know what was going on. 
<laughs> and it's, he, so, and, and George, who was the director, had, had like gone to do other things and other meetings and comes back at the end after I met all these people. And I was like, I was bewildered. I was like, of course, trying to explain my story as best I can. And I was like, I have no idea what's going on here. Yeah. And he says, okay, this is what's going on. I appreciate you come in to find out about the junior strategy job. And I think you have, a, you have the potential. We'd be willing to train. We'd be willing to take a chance and train you. But <laughs> what we really need is we're splitting off the digital department as a unit entirely, which is what I explained. Uh, he explained to me to begin with as a, so there's the big main agency and the digital agency, which is all stuck together. And he's like, we're growing like mad. We have tons of projects going on. We really need to find good people. So you know a lot of good people. If you would be willing to, to hire as many people as possible from your network uh, and basically set up a recruitment department for the digital team within the HR department, we in turn are willing to train you to do strategy. And I was like, okay, I guess, well, you know, I, I don't want to hear about a better deal possible. And that's what I did. <laughs> I think it's so awesome. And, and, so and also the thing to remember is that I, I took it on and I said, well, okay, this, so I, I will do one or two days of strategy a week and the rest I'll do in the HR department and recruitment. And I will train somebody uh, and hire somebody else once it's set up hmm. after my probation period. And after my probation period, I moved to strategy full time. And you, and you yes. negotiated this. This was yeah. like what you agreed. This was going to be the whole thing. Yes. You created and it. I'm, you also, made it happen. I'm mentioning this particular thing because that's how I made it happen. Yes. Had I waited for anybody to give me this, it wouldn't Absolutely. have happened. Absolutely. Really, really important point. Yeah. So, but I had, and go figure, I, 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 you know what? I would, credit, I would credit this to the training I've had when I was working with Landmark mm. in terms of being responsible, autonomous, mm -hmm. and independent in the way mm -hmm. that I'm working creative so i created of course i had support but i i didn't wait for anybody to tell me what to do and how to do it mm -hmm. i did it mm. i asked i went to ask my hr manager i went to ask the digital mm. because the, once i was hired george was nowhere around he was busy mm. i mean he's not nowhere around of course i saw him from time to time and i had training from phil who was the person who trained me who was the senior strategist who was awesome but i my what i mean by that is i couldn't if you know if you're waiting trying to get an appointment to wait to see how it's organized and to discuss it it'll never happen yeah so yep. i hired as yep. many and i hired 24 people in four in three months i set up the structure uh, which is <laughs> i set up the massive. structure for uh, and, and and i was doing still and i was doing one or two days a week on strategy so so i was working on a lot of hours both of those yep yeah and I set up all the structure needed uh, with the HR department and the HR uh, director really supported me. We're still friends on Facebook, but she's a really fantastic woman. She's got a massive job at a uh, head of uh, like global head of talent with uh, one of the big uh, media companies. And, uh, uh, and I hired the person who would take over my job. I interviewed her hired her vetted mm -hmm. her like then mm -hmm. she, she got the and then w one day after three and a half three or four months i showed up at strategy and said now i'm working here full time awesome genuinely inspiring so that that's bit. another thing that uh and there's there's one point within all of that which is that guy george took a risk yeah he's and absolutely. the the, and, the and idea also, of mentors as also, well. Also, the idea of mentors, because all the people, he's not the only one. So mm. while I mentioned some people who I knew as a recruiter didn't mm. listen to me that way, mm -hmm. I also managed to meet a lot of people who are strategists mm -hmm. who took time to chat with me, to give me advice, to have a drink, a coffee. And you soaked it all up. Yes, which is also why I do the same for others as much as I can. And now I mm -hmm. teach as well. Because mm -hmm. it's really out of generosity, sheer generosity, that a lot of those guys, there were meetups at the time. It was just both to talk shop, but also to share. And mm -hmm. some of the most you know, famous, kind of famous in our circles. So Faris Yaakov, uh, who is and now with his wife, have a traveling nomad consultancy. And uh, uh, he's one of the first people I met. I showed up at a beer thing that i found online of strategists 
and he said hi and you know welcome and smiled and and uh, Neil Perkin who's another person who has a massive blog and is big works with Google Firestarters and was a consultant now working with a number of agencies but he was at the time he was a big director for uh, IPC Media big media house mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh those two people were some of the two pe first people I met and, I, and back then I was interacting with people who knew a lot and still are people that are prominent you know within my field mm. who welcomed me openly mm. and that it's that night when I met those two guys and a bunch of others that I felt like I can do this I can mm. be this person I can mm -hmm. be a planner and I felt I felt at home with the conversations I was having <laughs> with these guys even though I didn't have a job yet and it gave me a lot of confidence that I could find something Mm. There's there's a and then you know 15 years later here you are. Yeah, My there's a bunch of other stuff that Brian's happened in terms is... of traveling, etc. But yeah, uh, but being those a digital are nomad, foundational digital and... nomads. But you've, yeah. I think you've, you've answered the question really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you've outlined the key incidents. What's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the question. <laughs> the question was, was there a defining moment in your career progression? Did it affect what happened next? And you've illustrated it perfectly. The, uh, and I think I'd, the me telling my career story, I can do it in like 30 seconds. I went to, I did everything my parents yeah, but said. No, without, without, but you could do it fast, but it's important because it happened. That's yeah. probably the likelihood and the, what seems natural to a lot of people. Yeah. And, well, and, 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 and there are similarities between and i'm going to tie it together with something that's that highlights similarities to the way we approach things so the i did everything my parents said i did everything my teacher said i did really well at school i went to a good school and then the i uh, the moment where one of the things that really defined my trajectory was wanting to do what i was interested in when i said i wanted to do psychology and business at university and my grandmother said to me, what do you want to do that for? Don't you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist? And I was like, no, I'm not interested in it. Very traditional kind of Asian background. Find a career that's beyond like where you're working. You have such a level of skill that you're not going to be knocked around by a recession. Hmm. And my dad's other idea was to say to me, get a job that's recession proof, like an accountant, where you're certified, qualified, and you can do that. And you're not like worried about what other people are going to do you can just do your own thing and i was like i'm not interested in that either i want to do psychology i want to do business i'm interested in these things standing up for what i was interested in was one thing that changed everything because i suddenly realized i had a choice about what i could do mm -hmm. i didn't have to do a levels i had some choice about what i did for a level i had a choice about whether i went to university or not that was a revelation for me because it was expected that i would go to university that was one thing. Then the second thing was a bit like you. I did two years at uni, then I worked for a year in marketing and then I did my finals. That year out, that year that was integrated as part of my degree, but working changed everything because I realized like, oh, this is what it's like to work. This is what it's like to have to pick up the phone and speak to someone that I've never done it before. This is what it's like where, hey, go do this. But what am I supposed to do? No one was going to tell you. No one was going to tell me. No one told me. I just had to do it. And it was so uncomfortable. And I'd never done it before. I was 20. I had no idea what was happening. And I did it. And it was around that time when I was 21 where I first did Landmarks course, which just blew me onto an, another trajectory. And then something that happened on my year out that changed everything was the I wrote my dissertation as part of my degree. My first great mentor thought it was really good. He really helped me through it. He gave it to the CEO. The CEO called me into his office like a week later. And I sit down and I'm like 21, wide-eyed, sitting down with a chair against the wall going, I can't, what's going on? Why am I here? He turns to me and he goes, this is really good what you've written. You could have written the long range plan for the company. And he photocopied it and gave it to all the managers which freaked me out at the time because then they all knew who I was. And I was like, I'm just a placement student. But I realized that I was very interested in making things happen. As a teacher, I've done the same thing multiple times in my school. Found an idea, written a proposal, 
given it to senior management and then things have changed. That's, and that I love doing that. After I graduated though, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to do something with marketing, didn't get many jobs, built databases part-time and then got a job working in a media planning agency and realized that the whole thing about Excel, data, numbers, making numbers meaningful was really valued. I worked in data planning. When I first started working data planning, marketing analysis, basically, there were four of us. When I left three years later, there was 24 of us. And I thought when I was 24, 25, I said to myself, I didn't want to be doing something where I, a career where I'm getting people to buy stuff they don't really want with money they don't have. I want to do something useful. I know you're making that face because Villain is making a face like that's what I do for my living. <laughs> I wanted to do something a bit more useful. So yeah. I went and spent a day in a school, loved it and retrained to be a teacher. And 18 years later, I love being a teacher. And the, the thing about generosity, I think is really important because I love that too. Giving back, that's why this podcast exists. It's why Teaching Tangents exists to create a different conversation for younger people to be able to explore and think in whatever theme we choose. So to round all this off, I'm reminded your story, everything you said reminds me of Steve Jobs' commencement speech about joining the dots forward. We don't know why something happens. We look back and we're like, oh, if Willem hadn't moved countries, if Willem's mum hadn't turned up at work, if Willem hadn't come to London and be like, I could do that. If Willem wasn't willing to learn, he wouldn't have been on this trajectory here. If I hadn't listen to my parents or challenge my grandmother I wouldn't have done this but you, when you look back you don't realize what's happening at the time so Steve Jobs called it join the dots forward trust that what's happening now is going to move you onto something but the the thing you said Willem about if you don't go try it you don't know well certainly one thing that uh and I can't remember if he mentions that as commencement speech but I love the idea of joining the dots forward, but it's it's a made up abstract principle. Yeah, it's totally. You can yeah. only look at the dots backwards. When you look yeah. back, it starts making sense. The yeah. only thing you can do is to to look and 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 not have any regrets. I think that's so, what he's. I think that's what he's saying. I think he gets to there as well. It's just well, take the you might have regrets, but you, but you don't. But take chances. Yeah. Now, but that takes some looking at, it takes some courage. It takes some looking at what it is that you actually want uh, and standing up for what you want the same way that you did when you started saying, actually, I want to study business and psychology. I don't want to be an accountant like my dad is saying or whatever. Um, yeah. Those moments, you don't, even if you take the opportunities, try things out, take a uh, risk. Of course, I'm not saying don't be an accountant. <laughs> Yeah, we need well, that. I am actually saying don't be an accountant, but the <laughs> well, I, think, I think if you want to be an accountant, it's awesome. Yeah, and actually, yeah, if, you, if you genuinely think because it's a great idea to have a sort of recession proof job, even though all these things are going to be able to be performed by robots, by the way. So, yes. you know, yeah. I think the idea of looking for a recession proof job is going to be getting thinner and thinner. Yeah, I mean, that's my dad uh, 25 so, years ago. Yeah. It's now, no, you can't, that's not going to happen. But the, this episode's question about the defining moments, yeah. they'll, you, you don't know what they're going to be. Take you don't chances, know what's going to happen in your life. And we all have stuff that happens where we do have a choice in the matter and the kind of stuff that we talk about a lot on getting to know yourself, meditation, mm. journaling, doing courses. By the way, as a side note, because we mentioned Landmark, but there's what also helped me while I was looking for a job as a strategist was doing the Gallup Strengths Finders uh, test. Ah, which I think is awesome. Uh, which we could talk about for a while, but I think we mentioned yeah. that. But you could go check up Gallup Strengths, Clifton Strengths. Clifton uh, Strengths. Psychometric tests all about yep. looking at what are your assets, what are your strengths. And that test uh, helped me uh, work and look at my CV and my life and express it in, in terms of what my strengths I have. Hmm. So that what I was talking about in interviews and the way that I wrote my CV reflected the strengths that I found in the test. So I did some work on that. Mm. Uh, so that also helped as a, another extra, from the, I don't know how many side notes. Of bonus. That, uh, another bonus thing. That's why it's uh, called teaching tangents. That's yeah. why. 
because yeah. we explore uh, and stuff. But the but where we do have a choice is what, how you react to the events that are happening. Yeah. What, what you're going to be, who you are and what you do in the face of what happens to you in your life that you have no control over. Now, there are things you have control over and choosing where you, what you want to study. And you might reconsider and choose something else once you, do, but anyway, all that. And the better you know yourself, the more man, the more influence you can have on reacting in a uh, in a way that will join the dot forwards, I guess, to use that sentence again. Because I was going to say positive, but it's not necessarily positive. It's just, you know, going in the direction that is the right one for you. Mm -hmm. And you're mm -hmm. the only one who knows what that is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. There we have it. Episode three, Teaching Tangents. It's actually the second episode. Oh, it's episode two. Season three, episode two. S I got it wrong. Season, season three, episode two. Was there a defying moment in your career progression? Did it affect what happened next? Thank you so much. Thank you. See you next time. See you next time. Oh, don't forget to send us questions and to like the video, subscribe. If you're still there, this is a long episode. We should have said that at the beginning again. We should say that at the beginning. Send We're us learning. questions. Send questions to James. Hello at jamesdesouza.com. All the links are in the description uh of the show notes whether you're listening to this or watching it on youtube one or the other we have the links in the descriptions and Great. we'll see you soon see you soon